Hear now the reading today from the 28th chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. Hear this word beginning at the 14th verse. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we have an agreement. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood have we taken shelter. Therefore, thus says the Lord, see, I am laying in Zion a foundation, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. One who trusts will not panic, and I will make justice the line and righteousness the plummet. Hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and water shall overcome the shelter. Then your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, you will be beaten down by it. As often it passes through, it will take you. For morning by morning it will pass through, by day and by night, and it will be sheer terror to understand the message. For the bed is too short to stretch oneself on it, and the covering too narrow to wrap oneself in it. For the Lord will rise up as on Mount Perizim. He will rage as in the valley of Gibeon to do his deed. Strange is his deed, and to do his work alien is his work. Now, therefore, do not scoff, for your bonds will be made stronger. For I have heard a decree of destruction from the Lord of hosts, upon the whole land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Some of you will remember the name Joseph Campbell. Do you remember that name, Joseph Campbell, from the public TV uh, series that featured him some years ago? Uh, before he became um, known on public TV, he taught in relative obscurity in the religion department at Sarah Lawrence College and, until one day Bill Moyers, the PBS broadcaster, discovered him and then he went on to do a series on Joseph Campbell and his ideas on religion and human life. So for a short time, Joseph Campbell, you know, most religion teachers in little liberal arts colleges don't get much national publicity, but Joseph Campbell did. And um, the specific ideas that had caught Bill Moyer's attention were from Joseph Campbell's book entitled the Hero with a Thousand Faces. Maybe some of you have read that book. Uh, incidentally, that book, Hero with a Thousand Faces, also caught the attention of George Lucas, the filmmaker. Did you know this? And it became the, the inspiration for the Star Wars series of movies that, that Lucas produced, though Joseph Campbell did not benefit from that, sadly. He died not long after the, uh, after the this PBS series aired. But the central idea of Campbell's book, Hero with a Thousand Faces. That lived on, and um, the thesis was that there is this story which recurs over and over in the world's great literature, including the Bible. And it's a story that also recurs in all of the world's great cultures, including the cultures of, of the Jews and our religious ancestors, the early Christians. And he called that story the hero's quest. Uh, the plot of the story is, is basically the, st the same, though the characters change. Uh, the hero's quest Campbell wrote about is this. A hero steps up at some decisive moment in history and makes a, a solitary journey, sometimes to climb a mountain to get the prize, sometimes to go to the cave to slay a dragon, sometimes to journey to the gates of some forbidden city to rescue a prisoner, something like that. Whatever the symbol for the stronghold of powers that threaten to undo 
the world's community and, and the powers that threaten to take away goodness and meaning from life. The hero is the person who faces up to those powers with courage and enters the struggle, prepared to give even his or her life if need be, and then comes out a new person with a new life and kind of becomes a model for us all. He said those stories, the hero's quest stories, those are everywhere in all the great literature and all the great cultures. Uh, in Britain, it's the Arthurian legends, right? Going after the Holy Grail, the brave knights uh, doing their job to, to retrieve that. In American culture, in some ways, the story of Lewis and Clark and the, the core of discovery, these brave guys going off into this unknown and presumed hostile land for the greater purpose of showing a destiny for a new nation, a hero's quest. And in the Bible, it's filled with them. And we've been talking about them this summer, uh, the hero's stories. Abraham leaving Ur of the Chaldees. You know, Ur of the Chaldees was the most civilized, safe part of the world in Abraham's day. And, and he heard this call, go to this land, I'll show you. And so, you know, to use the, the, uh, the, hymn, the hymns language, through many dangers, toils, and snares, he left Ur of the Chaldees and went off to follow where God would have him go. Or, or think of Moses leaving the comfort and security of being a shepherd in Midian to go to Egypt and to confront the Pharaoh. Or David leaving the simple life of a shepherd, the safe life of a shepherd, and going out to meet the giant, Goliath. Or uh, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was also on a hero's quest of sorts. He left his place of safety in the king's palace, where he was well fixed. He had ingratiated himself. Some think that Isaiah may have been an extended family uh, of the king, and uh, he was certainly well fixed and comfortable in the palace. But he left there in response to a call of God. You remember in Isaiah 6, that call comes to Isaiah. It comes in the form of a question. Whom shall I send to be the voice of conscience for this nation, new nation of Israel? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And in response, Isaiah, who could have said, send somebody else. You remember the famous, here, Lord, here am I, send me. Isaiah is the last of the Old Testament heroes I want to lift up in this little summer series we've been doing on heroes. And, and if the title today, Isaiah's King-Sized Religion, made you think even for a moment of beds, you were on the right track. Because did you catch it? That was the metaphor Isaiah himself chose in addressing what he saw to be the alarming moral drift in his community he was sure was going to lead to a bad ending and he felt compelled to address. It's an interesting image. Speaking about the religious practices of the Israelites of their day, Isaiah gets this vision from God and, and it communicates that to the people by saying this regarding their uh, uh, religious practices and their community morality. For the bed is too short to stretch oneself on it, and this covering is too narrow to wrap oneself in it. It's an interesting image. According to Isaiah, the trouble with the, the religion he was seeing practiced in ancient Israel was that it was not king-sized, or even queen-sized. It was cramped. It was like those little cots you get at summer church camp, you know, that you can't get comfortable in. He said it's, it's, it's confining and it's little and there's not enough warmth in it to keep, you know, it's like a tiny little cover that's not good enough to wrap you up in. It's not doing you any good at all. Which, when I read that, that's a creative description, don't you think? Clearly, it comes out of Isaiah's conviction, which was shared with all the prophets that if religion at its best is something that can broaden us and make us better people, bigger people, more compassionate people, more caring toward the, those who are excluded by the... If, if religion at its best can make us bigger, religion, when it gets off the track, uh, does just the opposite. You know, it narrows us down, and it leads us to be petty and, and insensitive to the needs of the poor and hostile to people who don't share our beliefs. Of that... Isaiah says that, that, uh, that religion is like a bed that's too narrow to stretch out in and a cover that's too small to warm yourself. 
And, and whatever else you may think of that, certainly this section of Isaiah, I just kind of chose it. I could have chosen one of many, or I could have chosen many different prophets. But the, it, what is made clear when you read the prophets is that th they shared a common belief, and that is that whatever else God judges when he looks at our lives, he certainly cares not just that we are religious, but he judges the quality of our religion. The, the, he asks the question, is, is this person being broadened and, 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 and made more compassionate, or is this religion narrowing this person down? Uh, does it lead them to be more the person I want them to be, or is it being used more as a kind of pious veneer to, to bring out, uh, you know, bring some respectability to, to some other values that they've already settled on that may, not, may or may not be something that I care about. There's no question that Isaiah saw it as his vision, as I think all the prophets, the great prophets of the Old Testament did, to call people to this kind of king-sized vision that we're to be bigger than we otherwise would be. And he goes on in the 28th chapter to say, here's how the Here's how that happens. Here are the two values that you need to let religion broaden you rather than narrow you down. And he goes on to say it this way. Behold, I am laying a foundation in Zion, a tested stone, a sure foundation. I will make justice the line and righteousness the plummet and will sweep away the refuge of lies and annul the covenant my people have made with death. Now, as I read that, it occurred to me, I better stop here and ask, is there anybody here who knows uh, what Isaiah is talking about when he says, I will make justice the line and righteousness the plummet? Do, do you know what a plummet is? Some, I see some of you old timers are, are shaking your heads. I, I only know what a plummet is because my dad ran a hardware store from his whole adult life, and I worked in the hardware store as a kid. And back in the days when I worked as in the hardware store, it's different than they are now. You know, you go to the hardware store now, everything is packaged up in those impenetrable plastic <laughs> packages. You know, it all comes from China. And, you know, but, but back in the, in the days of my, uh, my dad's hardware store, everything was just in bins. You know, you wanted four number six stove bolts an inch long. You, you didn't get a package of 400 of them. You, got, you could go in and say, I want four stove bolts, and we'd take you over to the bin and count out four stove bolts, and you'd get, you know, you'd give your 12 cents, and, and out you'd go. You, you, the, the deal was done. But, but we also had a bin of plummets. You know what a plummet is? It's, a, it's like a, a top. It looks like a little top. It's got a pointy... I used to play with them as a kid. You spin them. I think they're made of lead. That may explain what was kind of what happened to me. Um, <laughs> But I'd spin those plummets, and, and it like, looked like a little top, and it had a, it had a point, and then, and then it had a little, uh, a little place where you hooked the line, you know, to make a, a plumb line, right? You know what a plumb line is. A, a plum, and, and, and it was sold that way so you could make the plumb line as long as you needed it to be. You put your own line on it. If you're gonna, and, and, of course, the plumb line, if you were going to go hang wallpaper, you were going to go build a block wall, you needed a, a, a plumb line give you the standard, you know? What's the standard? Uh, what's the, what's going to make this wall safe? Uh, it, it, it's not, if it's not straight, it's going to collapse. It's not going to be secure. It's not going to be solid. It was the standard. And Isaiah hears God say, I have made justice my line and righteousness my plummet. And, and he's compelled enough by what he sees going on around him that he repeats this out loud to the powers that be in Israel, which at the time was a very dangerous thing to do. Because at that particular time in history, the Israelites were living through what, what was one of their least savory times in terms of their uh, moral behavior with their, with their neighbors around them. Uh, Israel was back then, as it is now, kind of uncomfortably sandwiched between two neighbors that were not always friendly to them. They were very uh, aggressive superpowers back in that day. It was Assyria on the north, now it's Syria, but it was Assyria back then, and it was Egypt on the south, and Israel had learned to survive in that day by kind of becoming very manipulative in the way that they related to others. They kind of played one of those superpowers off against the other, and the history of that time period, uh, it reads kind of like a spy novel. Israel forms all sorts of secret alliances. They lie one and play one against the other. They double-cross 
their neighbors at every turn. And, and they, all, they do this all with the blessing of the religious establishment of the day. And the religious establishment basically justifies it by saying, you know, God's on our side. We're God's people. God has a special place in his heart for us. And so if there are times when we need to exempt ourselves from the rules that we want everybody else to follow, we can do that. Uh, we, we're, we're God's chosen one. You know, it's a little bit, you know, like uh, the Abraham Lincoln issue, the time that during the Civil War when the, the general comes to Lincoln and reports all those casualties and sees Lincoln crestfallen at the reports of how many Confederates and Union soldiers are, are died, and the, the general says, never mind that, sir, God is on our side. You remember this? And Lincoln's famous quote is, uh, we should be more concerned whether we're on God's side. Uh, th th that's basically what Isaiah found himself doing. It was, he, he saw his land co-opting religion to give kind of a veneer of respectability for things that he thought were contrary to the values that, of righteousness and the plumb line of justice. And so he has this, you know, this bed's too small to lie down in. This cover's too teeny to wrap ourselves in. And whatever else you might say for Isaiah, this much you can say for sure, and it's true of all the prophets, they lived with this really consuming passion that the hearts and the minds and the trust of every person who professed God as their Lord would be utterly devoted to him first and foremost. I mean, that was the real thing. It wasn't that Isaiah thought they were wrong to mix their religion and their national politics. What he thought was wrong was they settled first on their politics and then they kind of jacked that up and drove the religious veneer under it to make it, which happens still to this day, don't you think? I mean, that's the real trouble with religion and politics mixing is that we forget which one should drive the other, which one should shape the other. Most people settle on their politics and then figure out, you know, pick and choose from the religion as to how to justify that. That's what Isaiah saw happening, and he said, no, no, you've got to know that if God is your God, you're, that's your primary, you know, thou shalt have no other gods before me. God demands our loyalty, he demands our life, and we are chosen he went on to say, which was not a popular message in that day, we are chosen not for privilege. We're chosen not to exempt ourselves from the rules, but we're chosen to be servants. We're chosen to be the avenue of goodness for this God to reach out to others. And you know, it seems to me every, ever since then, the most compelling voices of the church have echoed that kind of prophetic way of being in the world. John Wesley, our Methodist founder, once said that the great a uh, great metaphor for faith is he says it's like a, a giant wheel. And if you imagine there's a rim and there are spokes and there are, there's a hub. So you can like a, imagine a big bicycle wheel. John Wesley said the, the reality of faith is this. The, if God is the hub, the center of the wheel, everybody is, kind of finds themselves at the far hinterlands around the rim. And as they start to get closer to God, Wesley said, as we start to get closer to the hub, we become closer to every spoke in the wheel until you're, it all comes together in the center. So that's the way it is for a healthy life lived in faith. The closer you get to God, the more central God is to your life, the more you're attuned to the needs and the wants and the, and the possibilities uh, that are inherent in the true community and in caring for your neighbors. The uh, closer you get to God, the closer you get to one another, and the more you become focused on the whole rather than just, you know, the, the wants of your own little tribe, whatever it happens to be. And the implication of that for Wesley, just as it was for Isaiah, is that, in a sense, every Christian is called to be a prophet in the sense that we are all called to remind each other of our uh, uh, mutual responsibilities for the good of the whole. You know, it was Martin Luther who talked about the priesthood of all believers, you've heard that concept before, right? Where it's the, kind of the foundation of the Reformation, is that everybody has the, oper the ability to be a priest or to mediate the, the goodness of God in the world. So we don't have to have just you know, a few priests. Everybody is that there's a priesthood of all believers. Wesley and, and those in his train, I think, would agree that there's also a kind of a prophethood of all believers. We are all called to hold each other accountable for a kind of compassion for and care about the larger community. The closer we get to God, the closer we are to everyone else. And we're to live like prophets and make up our minds uh, that uh, uh, we, we care about the good of the whole. 
What does that look like? I was trying to say, you know, what would be, what would be a prophetic way of, um, of living in the world in, in 2014? It strikes me that one of the things it would m mean is uh, uh, being using those two benchmarks of righteousness and, and justice uh, in, in evaluating uh, life as we see it on TV and as we read the newspapers, you know, not allowing ourselves to be uh, caught by the spin that is so rampant, you know, in virtually everything we hear, you know, there's some kind of spin or other in the newspaper or the editorial page or documentaries on TV or the politician who's in front of us on TV or the radio pundits. We have to have what theologians called, there's a, there's a famous word, Reinhold Niebuhr came up with what he called the hermeneutic of suspicion, which is an interesting uh, uh, and, and big word, but it really very simple. What he, what he meant by that is that people of faith ought to be able to evaluate carefully in light of their scriptural values what the powers that be are trying to sell us, you know. And he says, you know, we should be suspicious anytime somebody with great power and privilege is coming up with an idea that's going to enhance the power and privilege of those who already have a lot at the expense of those who have a little. Uh, because there's a plumb line. I mean, that's the whole thing. You use that to evaluate what you see. Justice is our line, Isaiah says. Righteousness our plummet, says the Lord. And in every generation, the church needs to be that voice. And sometimes it's awkward. It requires sticking our necks out and sometimes uh, uh, raising uh, the eyebrows of, of the world around us. I was thinking about, what, what, is there a contemporary example of somebody who's done that? And lo and behold, just this past Wednesday, did you see the news reports? Pope Francis uh, weighed in uh, in a very pro prophet-like way on uh, folks who were... Uh, the, the protesters who are meeting those buses of kids, you know, the kids that are coming up uh, seeking asylum from El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras and, and seeking refuge here uh, for uh, great peril, you know, making this long trip. And, and the Pope, in, in what he said, acknowledged it's a huge political problem, uh, but, but what clearly, he said, has to stop are these protesters who are meeting these buses of terrified kids, you know, have already made this and, and sh shouting at them and telling them to go home and telling them they're not wanted. There was even one report this week of one of those mobs got a wrong bus. It happened to be YMCA kids going to camp. They thought I got the wrong bus and they scared these kids. And the Pope says in good prophetic tradition, it's not a simple thing to resolve, but here's this. But the church has the obligation to speak out whenever our society forgets how to weep forgets how to experience compassion and how to sympathize with the human plight of others whose lives are immensely harder than our own. And he, then he went on to say this, whatever your politics, God requires us to rein in the sin of indifference, which is right now taking us uh, from us the ability to feel for these children, many of whom have no option left than to do what they did. Whatever the long-term solution, now is the time to be compassionate and to take them in while we sort that out. Now, it takes courage to do that, and, and I, it strikes me that not really very much else distinguishes the heroes and heroines in our faith through history than, than that one virtue, the, the courage to use the plumb line of righteousness and the, the line of justice. And, and I know you're not the Pope, and, and neither am I, but by the grace of God, we each can find our voice and our capacity to act on those values every day we live. Our calling, like Isaiah's, is to practice this faith that's big. It, it's a big God we serve, and to not be narrow, and, and to not practice one, a, 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 a chopped-down religion that has no warmth to it, but that's king-sized. And to make our own heroes uh, uh, response and stand up for the love that Jesus taught, and, and it's something that's life-giving, and to trust that when we do that, God is there to bless it and multiply it. Today, for the close of the sermon, I thought I'd close in an unusual way. I, I've asked Sarah to, to sing the close today, a song she wrote that includes a chorus that echoes, I think, the prophetic voice and the king-sized faith that God uh, calls us to. And you'll see the words on the screen, but, but the chorus uh, goes like this, at least in part. And I don't know how you can end any better than have Sarah sing this. Forever in love abounding, from everlasting to everlasting, forever with grace surrounding, from transgression to compassion, as far as east is from the west, 
as high as the heavens are above the earth, as a father shows his mercy to his children oppressed. Amen. Sarah? 